Isaiah 33 is where we're starting again tonight. This is our theme uh, for this year. I just felt like we need to know certain things. So Isaiah 33, in wisdom and knowledge, shall be the stability of thy time. So tonight, and we talked about this last night, we're going to study deception. We're going to try to understand from the Bible how people become deceived. I have a friend that uh, has fallen for a grievous error. Fallen for a false teaching, a false doctrine. I've had this happen before. I had uh, a young man that I know that I had a lot of confidence in that God would make a great man out of him. And he fell into false doctrine. Fell into it hard. And it really, it really affected me. It hurt me. Because had I known where his mind was going, I think maybe I could have helped him by trying to give him scripture and to draw his mind back to the Bible. He was reading the, the works of a false prophet, a false teacher, and um, I didn't know it at the time. But it was changing his mind and his heart, leaning toward doctrines that are just blatantly wrong. And uh, when I found out, I was very, very, I was very grievous, a very hurt over it. And tried to reason with him, tried to talk to him, got nowhere. I was given scriptures and scriptures and scriptures and scriptures and was getting nowhere with him. And so it really bothered me. Here, here lately, this happened to a friend of mine. And I began to seek the Lord. And I said, God, I, I want to know what happens why does a person fall into something that is, if you read the Bible, you just know that it's not true, that it's not right? What happens? Why does a person do that? You know, there are over a billion people who identify with the Roman Catholic Church. And I'd say uh, a lot of American Catholics... They would call themselves Catholics, but I don't think that they necessarily know and understand what it means to be a Catholic, what, what is required of them. They're these Easter Sunday Catholics, you know what I mean. They're the Christmas Catholics. They're the once or twice a year Catholics, and they identify as Catholics, but other than that, they're not much of anything. But... All over the world, you have people that are just die hard. I knew a man, well, I knew a man who knew a man that was in a fundamental Bible-believing church and then left that church to become a Catholic priest. He left a fundamental church and went over and went through the process and he was granted his priesthood. He became a Roman Catholic priest. What happens to a person's mind to know what the Bible says and then go and lead people to pray to a statue? How does that even happen? I don't understand. So I began to seek the Lord about how people are deceived and God gave me some answers I'm, I'm still studying it but God gave me some answers let's go to 2nd Thessalonians 2 and here's the here's the prophecy part of why we're dealing with this we know from scriptures that a tremendous lie is going to be told the Bible calls it a strong delusion 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we touched on 2 Thessalonians 2 last night about the gathering and the man of sin, the son of perdition. The Bible says he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. So I asked last night if they brought in a man, if they brought in two men and both of them claimed to be Jesus Christ, would we be able to know 
which one or if any of them was in fact Jesus Christ. Would we be able to know that? Because this man of sin is going to sit in the temple of God and he's going to, people are going to believe that he is God, the one true God. But he's not. But people are going to believe it. So, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. Very important to remember that. Satan has built this man up and he is preparing everybody right now to receive him. He's preparing the world to receive this man of sin. After the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So right there, and I'm going to cover this in a little bit, right there you have some of the clues of why people are deceived or how they're deceived. Lying signs and wonders. Verse 10, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. So, the Bible's telling us that they did not receive the love of the truth. Who in here loves the truth? Jesus said in John 17, thy word is truth. So I love my Bible. My Bible is my best friend. My Bible is the one that I can go to to receive wise counsel. My Bible is the one that can tell me things that nobody else can tell me. My Bible is the one that knows me inside and out, knows my good things and knows my errors, my flaws, my sins, my weaknesses. My Bible knows all of those things, and I know my Bible knows those things because my Bible has showed me those things in me. I got those from the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So what happens if you insert the letter A before the word God? The word was A, God. That's what the Jehovah's Witness do in the New World Translation. They add one word, A, one letter, A, to that verse so that now Jesus is reduced to a created God and he's not equal with the Father because Paul said that Jesus thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. So we know from the Bible that Jesus is God. He is the everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. So we know that, but when you add that letter A to that verse, it changes your whole outlook on everything you read in the Bible now is basically de uh, interpreted by John chapter 1, verse 1. He is, and the word was a God. So now you can read the whole Bible and not see the divinity of Jesus because that one word has been added to the scriptures. Boy, the devil knows how to do this, does he not? He's been preparing this for a long time. They received not the love of of the truth and there are people who are deceived and they are so deceived because they want to be deceived some people like living a lie because it's easier than dealing with the reality of who they really are and dealing with real life. Some people just are that way and they don't want the truth given to them from the word of God. They want something beside that. So for that reason, for this cause, verse 11, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Now, let me give you an example of weak delusion. Have you ever heard of the Mandela effect? Know what it is? Somebody on YouTube or Reddit or Facebook or whatever note said that they knew for a fact that Nelson Mandela died while he was in prison. They knew it for a fact. But then when they read 
a Wikipedia article about Nelson Mandela, they found out that he not only lived, but he was out of prison and he became the prime minister of South Africa. That's a fact. And then he died. But him and a bunch of other people swore that they knew that Nelson Mandela died in prison. So they said, somebody at CERN, the Large Hadron Collider, a collider in Europe. Somebody, they crashed, split an atom, opened a portal in time, went back, stepped on a butterfly, or pushed over a bottle, or did something, and it changed, changed the whole universe, and now we are living in an alternate reality, but we have vague shadow memories of our other reality in the other timeline. Right? So then, they, then people were saying, well, I know for a fact that it was the Berenstain Bears, not the Berenstain Bears. And then other people started adding things that they knew for a fact, but now when they look at it, it's been changed. And then others were saying, even the Bible. Oh my goodness, the Bible used to say that the lion shall lay down with the lamb, but now when I read the Bible, it says a wolf, not a lion. Somebody's changed the Bible. <gasps> oh, no. And all of a sudden now, there are Mandela Effect videos all over YouTube. Facebook posts. Facebook is going nuts over the Mandela Effect that somebody has gone back, altered the timeline, and now we're in an alternate timeline. And everything in our timeline is different than the one that we used to be in. Now, I looked at that. And I wasn't even going to touch it, but some people called our ministry and said, Pastor, do you know that somebody went back in time and changed words in the Bible? So I did a two-hour presentation that's on YouTube called The Mandela Effect Madness. And what I said was, I know it's not true because I know what the Bible says. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 says that we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And I said, the Bible not only cannot be corrupted, it, or it is not corrupted, it cannot be corrupted. God, and I went through, I don't know, probably 20, 30 verses in the Bible where God said his word would be established and settled forever. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. So I went through two hours of Bible verses showing everybody that nobody went back in time and altered the Word of God. Nobody did. So that helped some people. That helped them with reality. Now I consider the Mandela Effect a weak delusion. And yet there is a... Um, he calls himself a Christian. He's a chiropractor... I have not, I've had bad feelings about him for years. I'm not going to mention his name here. But he's got one of these internet ministries going on. And he has followers all over the world. And he has come out openly declaring that he believes the Mandela effect has changed the Bible. And he's gathering people now who remember the words that used to be in the Bible. Come on in. We're just getting started. And there's free food over there. So maybe somebody can help you out, help them out, all right? But anyway, this guy has fallen for this. He believes that his Bible's got all these mistakes in it because somebody went back in time and changed the Bible. That is a weak delusion, and people fall for it. So God said that there's going to be a strong delusion. And if there is a strong delusion then the people who fall for the weak delusions do not stand a chance against the strong delusion. Every one of us needs an anchor, a hook that ties us and binds us to the Word of God so that when somebody says something that's a lie, we can know it's a lie because we know that every Word of God is pure and it's true. Can I hear you say amen? amen? So for this cause, for this cause, God shall send them strong delusions that they should be, believe a lie. And here's the purpose for it, that they all might be damned who believed not 
the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So I looked up the word delusion in the Bible. It's only in one other verse. It's in Isaiah 66. Uh, verse 2, for all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. That's me. When I read the word, sometimes I tremble because it's so powerful and it's so mighty. He, killeth, he that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man. He that sacrificeth a lamb as if he had cut off a dog's neck. He that offereth an oblation as if he offered swine's blood. He that burneth incense, incense as if he had blessed an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own ways. Now watch this. They've chosen their own ways, meaning that they decided to not go the way of scriptures. Everybody's got a choice in this way. Everybody's got a choice. You either go this way or you go the way of the scriptures. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So if you go a way that's not in the Bible, you're going your own way. And he said, and their soul delighteth in their abominations. That means that their soul would rather sin and do evil than follow God. So God said, I also will choose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them because when I called, none did answer. When I spake, they did not hear, but they did evil before mine eyes and chose that in which I delighted not. Now we know that God delights in his word so much so that the Bible says that God has magnified his word above what? His name. Thank you, brother. He's magnified his word even above his name. And so God delights in the word and God delights in his people who believe what God said. But there's always people. And the sad thing is there are people in churches who have chosen their own way rather than choosing Jesus and the Word of God, which is the way of life. So God said, this is the only other place in the Bible you're going to find the word delusion or delusions. And God said, because of that, I'm going to choose their delusions. God is still steering this world, even with all of its delusions. And I'm going to show you how that works. So let's go back to 2 Thessalonians 2. I want you to turn there because after he said... They, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Here's what he says to the saints who are not going to believe that. He says, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chose you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and, what does it say? Belief of the truth. Why did God choose you? Because you believed what God said. Who in here believes John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting... See, that's, one, that's the verse that practically everybody knows. You believe that one. How about this one? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You believe that? Amen. In the evening and the morning were the first day. You believe that? You believe Genesis 7, for yet seven days and I will destroy the earth with a flood. You believe that? Amen. You believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Before Abraham was, I am. So I like you guys, you know the Bible. God chose you because you believe the truth of God's Word. God will not allow strong delusion to affect you. He won't let it, okay? So verse 14, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast. The word fast here does not mean quickly. It does not mean speedily. It means fastened down. Your toes, your shoes, there's nails in your shoes hammered to the floor or screwed, screws are better than nails. Screwed down to the floor, you're not moving, you're not budging one inch 
from the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? Stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught. The traditions, he means, are the things taught in the Bible, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Establish. We use the word establish. It's the same thing. It means stable. Stabilized. Not bouncing to and fro with every wind of doctrine. You're not on the internet. Well, you may be on the internet. But you're not bouncing around to every stupid thing that somebody posts on the internet. Okay, I watched a video today. This guy, believe it or not, goes to an airport. And he has his brother filming him driving in his SUV as planes are landing. And his theory is that because he knows he was traveling 40 miles an hour and it looks like in the camera that the plane landing is traveling at the same speed he is, even though, now, so he thinks the planes are landing at 40 miles an hour, even though he's been told that the planes land at 120 miles an hour airspeed. So he figures, now he's got proof now that the United States is only 50% the size that they told us it was. That's his proof. How many of you have that emoji on your phone? I use that one a lot. Okay, that's a weak delusion. You would not be, do what? For him. You would not believe the number of people that liked that video and commented saying, thank you for revealing the truth to us. We know we've, we know we've been lied to. Okay? God has established you. And you're not going to be moved when God shakes heaven and earth. You're not going to fall for the strong delusion. And that's given to you not by works, but by grace. How many of you know that you don't deserve to be established by God? I don't. I don't. It's given. So tell God thank you. That he's put a love in you for the truth. Amen? So here's how men are deceived. Let's look at the scriptures, all right? Matthew 24, verse 4. Now, I'm going to run through a lot of scriptures. So if you want to try to keep up, if I pause for a while, maybe turn there or whatever. But if I'm running through them pretty fast, we'll, we're having this on video. We'll have it posted on YouTube in a few weeks. So just watch for it. Matthew 24, verse 4. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Take heed. The word heed is a hear word. It's a hear word. Heed means heed the Bible. Hear it and obey it. Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. That crowd that believes that the United States is 50% smaller than what the Illuminati airplane pilots tell us, they're going to be deceived by this. They're going to fall for that delusion. Because they don't believe the Bible. Okay? So remember, I said last night, we're going to bring two guys in here. They're both named Jesus. Can you pick the real one from the fake one? Because many, many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Matthew 24, 11, many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Jeremiah 48, 10, cursed be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully. Preachers, evangelists, YouTubers, bloggers, Facebook posters, priests. They will lie. 
They are saying that they are doing the work of the Lord, but they are doing it deceitfully. You know what my problem is? Some of them deceive people out of ignorance. Now, ignorance may be willful ignorance because they could very quickly learn the truth, but they won't. But I know for a fact that some people deceive people knowingly. They know they're fudging the facts. They know that they're skewing the evidence. They know that they're using tricks on people to promote their agenda. They know they're doing it. And they believe that they're doing the work of the Lord, but they're doing it deceitfully. And Jesus said, take heed. So, one of the ways that people will be deceived is by falling for another Jesus. That's what Paul warned us about. He said, Satan through his subtlety deceived Eve. He said, it's going to be just like that. For he is going to be some way coming, preaching another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel. And they're going to believe it. They're going to fall for that other Jesus. And so I'm telling you, know your Bible. Know what it says. Know how to identify the real Jesus. So that you are not deceived by the fake one. Here's a test. We had our local hospital. There's a hospital just about three blocks away from our church. It's our local hospital. I've had my broken arm fixed there. I've had lots of things done there. But a big company bought that out, the Mercy Hospital System, run by the Sisters of Mercy, a convent. That company has gotten big and they're buying hospitals everywhere and building places everywhere. They got money. So now in every room in that hospital, they've put a cross with a Jesus on it. Is that the real Jesus? How do you know? Tell me how you know. He's not on that cross anymore. That's good. Amen? He's not still on that cross. Give me another reason why it's not the real Jesus. Who, who ever made that crucifix did not see the face of Jesus. How do they know what he looks like? They don't. So they put the image of a man and the Bible tells us that, to, that God is going to curse somebody he calls the idol shepherd. I-D-O-L shepherd. That figure hanging on that crucifix is not Jesus. It's the idol shepherd. A statue, an image that God said do not make. So that's how we know that that's not the real Jesus. The wafer, that the Catholics, other, other churches kind of believe this, transubstantiation, consubstantiation is a variation of that, but they believe that they literally turn the wafer into the physical body of Jesus and you are eating his literal flesh and drinking his real blood. How do we know that's not true? Number one, they've crucified Jesus afresh and brought him to an open shame. That's number one. Number two, we are told by the apostles to not eat any food offered, sacrificed to an idol. And they perform the mass in front of the crucifix. Number three, we're not to drink blood, period. We are not to drink blood. That's Acts chapter 15, in case you've never heard that before. And he included fornication along with that. So there was four things that the, the church apostles and elders said, this is what we agree to, that the Gentiles should not do. Eat anything strangled, eat anything with blood in it, eat anything that's been offered and sacrificed to an idol, and do not commit fornication. So that's how we know that that wafer is not the real Jesus.
Amen? So many shall, so this is how people are deceived. They are deceived by believing that that is the real Jesus, and it's not. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, be not deceived. Evil communications, evil communications corrupt good manners. Do you believe that popular music has an effect on the morality of America? Where's my amens? Where's my loud amens? Do you believe that Elvis Presley and Conway Twitty and Jerry Lee Lewis had an effect on the morality? Jerry Lee Lewis admitted it. He admitted it. He was raised in a, him and Jimmy Swaggart and um, Mickey Gilly are first cousins. First cousins. They all learned to play the piano. They all learned that rock music style. They were all raised in church. And Jerry Lee Lewis said, I know I'm playing the devil's music. Conway Twitty said, I know that we're contributing to the moral delinquency of America. These men said that. They knew that they were singing songs that were immoral and, and songs that were to be sung in bars, talking about adultery, fornication, uncleanness. Evil communications corrupt good manners. And he's not, when good manners, he's not talking about don't burp at the table and use, don't use the right fork. Good life mannerisms, morals, our character, the way our children are raised, that music has an effect. So when Katy Perry sings to 12 and 13 year old girls, I kissed a girl and I liked it, what is she promoting in that music? Sodomy. And do you think that girls then are going to experiment with that, because Katy Perry said that she liked it. That's exactly right. Romans 3, 12. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. That's why your breath stinks like dead people. Amen? First thing in the morning... Don't breathe on somebody. You've got dead things in there. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With, with their tongues they have used deceit. The mouth of man will lie. Will it not? Let God be true and... That includes me. It includes me. I don't mind saying that to you. I don't think that I have it all figured out. I strive for truth, I beg God to show me truth, and I ask God to only let me speak truth. But I am not God, and I'm not going to be qualified to speak the truth 100% of the time, except when I'm reading the Word of God. Then I'm right. Then I know I'm right. With their tongues they've used deceit, the poison of asps is under their lips. Where, do, where is the poison of serpents? It's in their mouth, under their tongue. That's where their poison comes from, their mouth. And that's, what, that's the point that God is making here. The devil, there's a theory out there that says the devil had sex with Eve and made Cain. The Bible does not say that. The Bible says that we know that the serpent spoke to Eve. That's how he poisoned her. It was with what came out of his mouth. It was his words. And that's what he's saying here. Is that the poison is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Ephesians 4.14, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro. Who else goes to and fro? Drunkards? The earth is going to reel to and fro like a drunkard? What else? The lion. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, going to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. They're tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. That's what I was saying to every new thing that comes on Facebook. People believe it. There are people on Facebook, the stupidest things in the world. They pass that on to everybody. You've got to watch this video, and it's stupid. Amen? Amen. It's nuts. We, we've just proved that the earth, America is only 50% as big as what they've lied to us about. That is the stupidest thing. 
And I, 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 sent a, I sent that video to a man that is an, a commercial airline pilot, follows our ministry, and I said, you got to watch this video because he knows about landing airplanes. And don't you think that we are smart enough if you've ever driven even half of this country, you know how big it is? If you've ever driven from Washington, D.C. to St. Louis, which we've done, I know how big the country is. Not stupid. Amen? Amen. Tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men. You know what that is? Let me show you what slight is. It's my favorite, my favorite trick. It's called the disappearing quarter trick. Okay? Gone. Never left the hand. And I can fool kids. I can fool people. I had a guy, a, a fellow pastor of mine, he would, used to do children's ministry, and he made something disappear out of his hand and repair of his And I, went, I looked at him for 15 minutes going, how in the world did you do that? And it was there in front of me. He had a fake thumb that magicians use, and it was as, it was as big as my head, big around as my head, and I never noticed it. And he would just shove that down in that fake thumb and put that back on his hand and act like there was nothing there. The slight of men, they get you to look here while they deceive you this way. Okay? That's how they do it. They're using tricks and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. There are people who sit and do nothing but troll my YouTube channel and Facebook page. And they just wait for me to say something against their pet doctrines and they'll jump on it right away. They lie in wait to deceive people. Ephesians 5, 6, let, let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Have you ever sat through a sermon for 40 minutes where nothing from the Bible was ever quoted? What that means is that every word that that man said was vain. Because we can't make a lasting change in people's lives. Only the word of God can do that. And if a sermon goes without the word of God, it's vain. It's done in vain. Colossians 2.8, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. So the, the, let, by, let God be true and every man a liar. Let the Bible be true and every man a liar. Just because Bill Nye, the science guy, doesn't believe in Noah's Ark does not mean that Noah's Ark is not true. It does not mean that the flood story is not true according to the scriptures. It does not mean that. The best scientists in the world, they don't believe the Bible. I don't care. I do. And I believe what it says. And I want to tell you this. You say, well, I believe John 3, 16, and that saves me. But do you believe Genesis 1? Do you believe Genesis 7? Do you believe Genesis 14? Do you believe Genesis 23? Do you believe uh, Exodus chapter 14, where they walked across the Red Sea? Do you believe those stories in the Bible? It, do you believe that Jonah was in a whale's belly three days and three nights? Because Jesus said, as Jonah was in the whale's belly three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. And if Jonah was not in that whale's belly that long, then that means Jesus was basing his doctrine of what he did in the heart of the earth on a lie and it's not true i'm not allowed to believe something that's not true the vain words of men philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men that's how men are deceived here's another here's another way vanity and pride there are three types of sin according to the bible lust of the flesh lust of the eyes and pride of life I would rather be guilty of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and am, where God can chasten me, because if you're too proud, God said he resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. And when it comes to pride, people who are proud will never admit that they're too proud. They're too proud. They'll never admit it. They can never be changed. So watch this, Job 15, let not him that is deceived trust in vanity, for vanity shall be his recompense. 
It shall be accomplished before his time, and his branch shall not be green. He shall shake off his unripe grape as the vine, and shall cast off his flower as the olive. For the congregation of hypocrites shall be desolate, and fire shall consume the tabernacles of bribery. Here's another way people can be deceived. They can be deceived by bribes. Preachers will preach or not preach certain things because they know that they'll lose their job if they preach certain things in their church. And I know that is true. I've, I've known the men. I've heard the stories. Bribery will change a man's gifts. Pay, payment will pay you to do this. We'll pay you to believe this certain way. They conceive mischief. Let me, let me just tell you this. YouTube videos now can be monetized. Do you know what that means? It means YouTube likes to play advertisements before you watch a video, unless you pay them monthly. YouTube receives billions of dollars every year from that advertising. They have a way to share the, the profits with the people who have the videos on YouTube. So if a guy posts a video on YouTube and it gets millions of hits, he's monetized that video and he gets money from that video. And I've noticed that some of the stupidest, some of the most outrageous videos on YouTube are the ones who get the highest hits. They're watched by millions of people all over the world. And the people who posted them don't really care if what they said in the video is true or not. They just know that they're going to get paid for it. Bribery can deceive people. Obadiah chapter 1, the pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Now we're getting into the heart. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock whose habitation is high that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? That's a proud person. And it's the pride of their heart that has deceived them. Sin. Sin will deceive you. Your doctrine will be based upon your sin. Why do you think a preacher would quit preaching against sexual immorality and never preach against it. Why do you think that preacher would stop preaching on fornication and adultery and uncleanness and lasciviousness? He's guilty. His sin has changed his doctrine. It's changed his preaching. Why would, why would a preacher want to start having Bible studies in a bar? This is being done. Why would a preacher want to have Bible studies in a Hooters restaurant? Tell me why. Figure it out. Why would a man want to have a Bible study in a Hooters restaurant? Because it's a Hooters restaurant. It's the lust of the eyes and lust of the flesh. And anybody smart can see right through that. He justified it. This is a real thing. He justified it by saying, I want to reach sinners where they are. Sin... Your sin will deceive you. Hebrews 3.13, but exhort one another daily what is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. There it is right there. Exhort one another. That means find a fellowship so that you can be exhorted or that you can exhort others. Now, I'm not saying you have to go to a church that's not following the Word of God. But we have different ways now. I'm here because there is a group of believers 
that fellowship with us online. And they encourage one another through the internet. I encourage them. They encourage me. And I need the encouragement. But he said, exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. I've been pastoring for getting close to 30 years. And I know people. They come to church, they're very faithful, and then, all of a sudden, they're not there so much anymore. And what I know almost for a fact is sin got them. Because usually the first thing that goes is prayer and Bible reading, and then after that, it's church attendance. They don't want to hear the word of God because it will make them guilty because they'd rather sin than come to the truth. That's what the devil did to them. Now, I like it when they come back because when they come back, they come back pretty good after, because of their experience. God may have let them go out in the wilderness to see what it's like out there and then bring them back. Lots of people have been through that. But sin will harden your heart and you will not believe the Bible anymore. Ephesians 4.22, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. See, the old man in us is still alive, is he not? And the old man doesn't want to get up on Sunday and go to church. The old man doesn't want to read the Bible. The old man doesn't want to pray and ask for God's help to stay away from sin. The old man wants to go party. The old man wants to go sin. The old man wants to lust. The old man wants to do the things that the old man used to do all the time. That's what the old man does. That's why you've got to crucify that old man every day. Every day. Take up your cross and follow Jesus. Because... Your lusts will deceive you and you will believe false doctrine and not the word of God simply because the thorns of sin and your lust choked out the word of God. How many of you know that's true? Matthew 13, 22. He also that receives seed among thorns is he that heareth the word and care of this world and the deceitfulness of what? Joel Osteen writing his book, Your Best Life Now. That's a bunch of, that comes from hell. That is from hell. Your best life is waiting for you on the other side of Jordan. Not now. He has and he epitomizes the deceitfulness of riches. And I, see, I not only see it in America, but I see it when I go to Kenya. I see the influence of the rich and wealthy pastors from America who's gone over there to those poor third world countries to try to convince those people that they can be wealthy if they just give their shillings to that man. Creflo Dollar, I was in Kenya when he did this. He came in on his private jet, escorted in his limousine to a hotel in Nairobi, for a $1,000 a plate dinner for pastors. They had to pay $1,000 to get to hear this man speak, get their picture taken with him, and those pastors were hitting up their, their church members for the money to go and sit with this man and have their picture taken with him and get blessed by him so that they could bring that anointing back to their churches. And that man, he took those poor pastors' money, got back in his private jet, and went on somewhere else. That makes me angry because I don't have a private jet. <laughs> I had to sit and coach. But I'd rather do that. What I, we have two radio stations in Kenya, and I, I went and visited both of those places, and I wanted to let those people know I'm not here to take anything from you. I'm here to give. And they know that. They know that by my reputation. But sin... Your sin, listen to me, guys, get your sin under the blood. Get your, get your lust, get your pride, get everything under the blood, or it'll deceive you. It'll make you think false doctrine. 
Man's own heart will deceive him. Jeremiah 17, 9. Uh, underli- take, open your Bible, Jeremiah 17, 9. Underline this verse. It's a very powerful verse. But it describes the heart of man to a T. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Our hearts, our hearts are desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. So where does deception start? It starts in the heart of man. When he has not yielded his heart. See, your heart, who in here has seen me teach about the body being the temple? So you know what I'm going to say. Your heart, that four-chamber heart, is the throne of God. The four chambers represent the four living creatures that carry the throne of God. The, the uh, pericardium is that sack of water, which is the sea of glass that surrounds the throne of God. The 24 ribs are the 24 elders that surround the throne of God. The lungs are the seven spirits of God because the brachial tree branches off into seven branches and it looks just like a tree. And the candlestick in the tabernacle was an almond tree. And those were the seven spirits of God. So the heart is the throne of God. And he wants to rule from man's heart. But man's heart has to be yielded to God. God will never take it by force. Remember what I said last night. Where's Jesus? Standing at the door and knocking. He does not force entry. He asks May I come in? And when you willingly let Jesus in, he comes in to be King of kings and Lord of lords. And your heart gets yielded over to the Holy Spirit. And now the Holy Spirit is helping you make your decisions instead of your own wicked, deceitful heart. Does that make sense to everybody? That your heart, your natural man heart is destined for hell. Destined for hellfire because it's deceitful and wicked above all things. And you know it. My daughter Lindsay, back here, I I think she escaped because she knew what I was going to say. She's our first child, and I will never forget the day that she first lied to us. And it was over something that she had done And we asked her, did you do this? And she said, no. Hi, Lens. Now, her mama did not take her aside the day before and say, I want to teach you how to do stuff and get by with it. I did not teach her how to lie. In fact, I always taught my children, tell us the truth, And the truth will make you free. You probably won't get a whipping. But if you lie to me, it's a guaranteed whipping. And mom and daddy almost always know when they're lying, don't we? You read those, you can read it in their face. You're lying to me. I can see it in your eye. You're lying through your teeth to me. I'm going to whip you. I'm going to get you. The truth makes them free. But nobody taught her how to lie. She inherited it from her dad and from her mom. Because we're liars. And our children turned out to be everything that Lisa and I already were. That hurts you as a parent. Amen? That gets you. So the heart of man is automatically wicked and deceitful and willing to be deceived. It takes the act of God to change a man's heart. Amen. James 1.22, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So think about that. People sit in a church service all the time. Amen the message. Pay their tithes, get up, walk out, and forget everything that they heard. And they're absolutely not going to do what they amened in the sermon that morning. They're absolutely not going to do it. So their salvation, their Christianity, 
to me, is null and void. If they are hearers of the word and not doers of the word, then they deceive their own selves. They lie to their selves. And you, did you know that we can end up believing our own lies? We're capable of it. James 1.26, If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is in vain, he said. That's why I said what I said. You're hearers of the word, you're not a doer of the word. You're, you don't bridle your tongue. Your tongue can set the world on fire, can it not? In a bad way. Your tongue, James said, is the most wicked member of your body. Your tongue is, your mouth. Are you listening? Your mouth is. When you speak God's word, you're not lying. When you're speaking your own words, you're capable of it. Bridle not your tongue, he deceiveth his own heart. 1 John 1, 8, here's a good one. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And I've heard some of these TV preachers, bless God, I haven't sinned in 25, 26, 27 years now. It's been 27 years since I've sinned a sin. Bless God. In fact, that's why God blesses me so much is because I don't sin anymore. That man's a liar. That man is a deceiver. He's a liar. And he's setting people up for a fall. He's making those people think that they can be holy and righteous by their own mind and by their own effort. And he's setting them up for a fall. That man's religion is in vain. He's a wolf. The truth is not in him. He has deceived himself. Now, I'm just going to tell you, sin is everything that God said don't do or do that you don't do. Does that make sense? If God said it was a sin in his word, then it's a sin. If man said something was a sin, but it's not in God's word, it's not a sin. My friends, when I was growing up, told me that I had said a dirty word one time. Want to know what I said? Poke salad. I was five. And I said poke salad, and my friend said, Oh, I'm telling your mom, What? You said poke salad, that's a dirty word. I didn't, that's not a dirty word. I didn't. And I went, because mom had already washed my mouth out with soap <laughs> for saying dirty words. Amen? <laughs> dirty words should taste like soap. Amen? I want my grandchildren raised to know what soap tastes like. <laughs> but I went running, crying to my mama. And she had to fight back the laughter. She calmly said, it's not a dirty word, don't worry about it. But man, I see it on Facebook all the time, men condemning other people over something that is not in the Bible. If God doesn't condemn you, you're not condemned. But if it's in his word, you are condemned. But when you say that you that what you're doing is not a sin and God said it's a sin you've just I worked with a guy used to paint houses and I worked with a guy he came to work with us I was a young man then and um, was not pastoring a church yet but I was I knew I was headed for that one day and he started in with this thing that he was sleeping with a lady from his church. They had started living together. And I said, what does your pastor think about it? He said, I don't care. He said, it's not wrong. I love her. She loves me. What's wrong with that? And I said, it's fornication. It's adultery. God said, don't do it. He said, but we're soulmates. I believe we were meant to be together. I, don't, I love her, she loves me, I don't see anything wrong with that. This man deceived himself. I, there was another man that I was working with, his, him and his wife, they had like three or four children. 
And he came to me, knew that I, I was already pastoring a little church. He came to me, and he told me that he was having an affair with the organist or the piano player at his church. And he was coming to me because he wanted me to tell him that apparently God wants you two together. That's what he wanted me to tell him. And I said, you're living in adultery. You're committing adultery. It's not, it's not sleeping together. It is adultery. You're committing a sin in the eyes of God. He said, but I believe we're meant to be together. I, I don't believe I should have ever married my wife. Then you shouldn't have married her. But you're committing adultery, and you will never be able to justify this in God's eyes. And I'm not going to tell you you're doing right, you're doing wrong. He didn't like that. But his sin deceived his heart. Do you see that? So anything that I told him from the word of God meant nothing to him. Sin's a very powerful deception. And it'll take over your heart. That's always where the deception starts. If a man <clears throat> thinks something in his head, God has given us an amazing processing feature in our brain. And, you know, during the day, we're processing problems all day long. We're thinking about what we're doing at work, working through issues there, but if there's no issues with work, then our brain is processing things going on at home, or things with other people, or maybe we're thinking something in the Bible, or whatever. But our brain is working non-stop during the day, and we're thinking things, and we're working out things. So <clears throat> if a man is, is presented with something in his head, and he's not sure about it, he, he, it may sound, sound good, may sound right, but he's processing it, and he gets counsel from somebody. Let's say they, you know, people call me all the time, want me to help them you know, work out something or answer a question or something. And, and I love that part of that ministry. God's given me, you know, some good things. And I just want to spend my life giving back to God's people. Um, and so they'll ask me questions and I'll try to give them biblical answers. Here's what the Bible says. Bible says this, Bible says that. And I've just, you know, it's amazing how how direct the word of God hits people and they say, you know what, I never thought about that verse, but that is right, that is true. Um, I had a guy, well, I, can't remember, I can't remember the issue, but he called me, or he, yeah, he called me one time and he said something about the rapture and gave a little theory about it and instantly a verse came to my mind that directly contradicted what he said. And I said, but the Bible says this. And I can't remember what it was. And he said, you know what? That's right. I never thought about that. He said, okay, I'm done. I, I'm not going to think about that ever again. And I said, I want to commend you. I want to say thank you to you because you let the word of God correct you. And I said, I wasn't being mean. I wasn't trying to sound mean. I just gave you the verse. And I said, but you received it. That tells me you believe it in your heart. And God reigns in your heart. I just want to commend you for being corrected by the word. He wasn't corrected by me. It's corrected by the word of God. And we just had a great conversation. So when it's in your mind, somebody can put something in your mind. Somebody can then talk you out of it. Let, come, Jesus said in Isaiah, Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. God is a reasonable and a reasoning God. This part of our brain, the frontal lobe, does it makes moral decisions. When we say, I've had this on my mind all day long, we, we mean it's right here. We even say things like, you know, that was in the back of my mind. And literally, there are places back here where there's stored information. So, I mean, we're saying things that are true. So, if it's in a man's mind, he's looking for answers. He's sorting through facts that he knows, but maybe he doesn't know everything. So, he gets counsel from somebody or 
he's reading the word of God and God gives him an immediate answer and he says, you know what, that's right. Thank you, God, for, for correcting me. And then he's done with it. And the thing is, it hasn't gone to his heart yet. Because once something gets in the heart of man, it's hard to get it out. So that's why when we're saved, with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation, but with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. There are people who profess Jesus with the mouth, they don't believe it in their heart. They're not saved because it's in the heart. So, my testimony concerning this Bible, you've probably heard it, but God was leading me through a pathway of thoughts one day. And I was sitting in my office there at the church, and I was doing what the Bible says, think on these things. And I was walking down a trail in my mind of things that I had learned things that I had thought, things that God had showed me. And I got to a place, and the Holy Ghost said, Mike, you know that Bible is true and has no errors in it. And just like that, it was in my heart. And I immediately, and I mean I immediately received that. It was in my heart, but I didn't have the evidence so over time, you know, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So while I had faith that what the Holy Ghost had spoken to my heart was true, I wanted to seek the word for evidence. And I've come across verses like, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And so I was reading things in the Bible where God promised that his word would be perfect forever. Not just in the originals, which is what I used to believe, but his word would be perfect and sure and incorruptible can't be nobody went through a time portal and changed words in the bible and now we have an alternate king nobody did that it's not possible that anybody could do that and i just that was from what was in my heart it is in my head it is in my heart and it's never gonna leave me ever I'm stuck with this Bible. Amen? Okay? So that's how it is with salvation. You get stuck with God. You are anchored and you're not going anywhere because it's in your heart. But what happens when a person is deceived in their heart? So 2 John verse 7, Bible says, Many deceivers are on Facebook. Yeah, look, see? It says it like, like right here on Facebook. There. Facebook. Many deceivers are entered into the world. That's right. And they're on Facebook. And they're on YouTube. And they have blogs. Okay? They are deceivers. I have run into... You name it, I've run into it and I've tried to deal with it because I, I'm like David. David said it twice in the Psalms. I hate every false way. If it's a false doctrine, I hate it because normally I know that it's meant to put people into bondage of some kind. That's what man does. Man loves to enslave other men. Man loves to get other men to serve him. The false teachers and the false prophets are there to make disciples unto themselves, the Bible says. They want followers. They like it when many people follow them on Facebook or many people are following them on YouTube. And I've had people brag to me. 
trying to prove to me that they were right because they had more YouTube followers than I did. I don't care. I don't care. This is not a popularity contest because the Bible says many are going to be deceived and few are going to be the ones who find the truth. Okay? So, many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come to the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. This is the spirit of antichrist deceiving people. 1 John 4, 3, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, notice that, is not of God, and this is that spirit of antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Now, in that same verse, in the New International Version, notice what it says. Every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. Something's missing. 1 John 4, 3, every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. The NIV took out is come in the flesh in that verse what does that tell you it's the spirit of antichrist they took it out of the very verse that john said if anybody does not come if they come saying that jesus christ is not coming to flesh or whatever if they don't say that that's the spirit of antichrist and the niv doesn't say it that tells me something tells me that people are being deceived by false Bibles. So, I'll bring this up again. Is Jesus the Son of God or a Son of the gods? The Son of God. So, the NIV, the New American Standard the Holman Christian Standard, which is the Southern Baptist Bible, all of them say a son of the gods in Daniel 2, Daniel 3.25, where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was in the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar looked in there and he said, I see a fourth, and the fourth is like unto the son of God. That's what the King James says. But the New International Version and all the other modern translations say a son of the gods. That is a different Jesus than the one that I believe in. Can you say that? Do you, believe in, do you believe in the one in the fiery furnace that is the Son of God? Or do you believe the one in the fiery furnace that is a son of the gods? The Son of God. So you are saying you do not believe what's written in the NIV. You do not believe what's written in the Holman Christian Standard or the New American Standard or the, Revi or the New English Version or any of these other modern translations. They've all got a variation of a son of the gods. One of them says one of the gods. That's what the Jehovah's Witness believe. Okay? So if you don't believe that Jesus is a son of the gods, then you don't believe those Bibles. Okay? You believe what God said in the King James. The Son of God. And I've heard people say, well, Nebuchadnezzar didn't know who was in there. I guarantee you, when you see Jesus for the first time, I don't care who you are, you don't know who it is. Matthew 24, look at this. There shall arise false Christ and false prophets. And shall show great signs and wonders. Have you heard about churches where there's gold dust coming down from heaven? Angel feathers coming down. People, all of a sudden, they open their mouth and they have gold teeth. And they didn't have gold teeth before. Have you ever heard of that? Huh? Yeah, the anti-Bethel in Redding, California. They do that all the time. Okay? Lying. Now... Are they, is that really happening? It doesn't matter. It is a lying sign and wonder. It is meant to deceive those people and it's working. They fall for it. They believe it. 
Revelation 13, 14, it deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do. The false prophet is actually going to have the ability to perform miracles. So you got all these people going to these miracle crusades. Hundreds of thousands of people show up to these things, especially in third world nations. Because they don't have the hospitals we have. They don't have the, the medical care that we have. They don't have the, the, the medicines that we have, the ability that we, they don't have those things. And so they're jumping on, maybe, hoping maybe somebody will heal them, but they're doing line signs and wonders. And that false prophet is going to have the power to do these miracles. So what did the Jews want out of Jesus all the time? Show us a miracle. Show us a miracle. And Jesus said, a wicked and adulterous generation always seeketh after a sign. Revelation 18, 23, and the light of the candle shall no more at all be at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride shall be heard no more in all thee. That, think about that. The bridegroom is Jesus, and the bride is the church, and their voice is not heard at all in Babylon. How about Babylon churches? That'd be a good sermon to preach, wouldn't it? Because in Babylon churches, the voice of the bridegroom is never heard. What is the voice of the bridegroom? Bible. The Word. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all these nations, or all nations, deceived. Sorceries. Lying signs and wonders. Miracles. Magic being done. Revelation 19:20, and the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. So people can be deceived by what they see. You know, I like to watch magicians. I like to study how they do things. I like to try to figure out their tricks. I used to put a videotape in and record every time David Copperfield had a special on TV, and I would videotape it, and then I would play it back a hundred times and try to pick out how he walked through the Great Wall of China, how he made the Statue of Liberty disappear, how he made a jet disappear. I always tried to, I wanted to figure that out. I wanted to know how these men did this because magicians go to great lengths to deceive people and some of them, some of these guys who do street magic or whatever, they make people think that they have actual powers. Some people on the internet have written me saying, I think these guys have devils. I think it's possible they do. But I don't think that they're working actual miracles yet. But people can be easily deceived. Easily deceived. Even smart people by miracles and signs and wonders. People that depart from the Word of God. Your Bible should be your best friend. It should be who you go to when things are not right, things are not well. It should be who you go to when things are well so that you're prepared for the day that you're not doing so well. It should be your counselor. It should be your guide. It should be your chastening rod. It is, its words are powerful. They, its words are alive. You do not have to make the word of God effectual in your life. All you have to do is let God plant the seed of the word of God. And how does, wh what is it that makes a seed come up out of the ground? The seed. It's, the rain does, the rain rots the, the chaff off, the body, but the DNA, the book inside of it, makes it work. You don't have to do anything to make seed grow. It does it on its own. And the Bible doesn't really have to be applied. Just let it go in you and believe it, and God will work it in you. How many of you know that by experience? 
You know that God has made changes in your life and you had nothing to do with it. It was all God. So, when you depart from the word, Psalm 119, 18, Thou hast trodden down all them that err, err from thy statutes, for their deceit is falsehood. Err from thy statutes. The word err, E-R-R. We have a word in English that we use that goes along with that. What is it? Error. I believe, this is not me talking, I'm pretending to be a lot of preachers nowadays. I believe the Bibles all have errors in them. You ever heard that? You ever heard preachers say, oh, I think all the translations have things that are wrong in them. And you really need to get into the Hebrew and Greek to know really what the Bible says. But is that true? On the day of Pentecost, God translated his word into the languages that the people spoke and understood. God did it on purpose. And I believe that God, Joseph said to uh, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, do not interpretations belong to God. And so one of the gifts of the Spirit is the interpretation of unknown tongues. And I believe that this interpretation, this translation from the original Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, along with the former translations, diligently compared and revised, I believe that this Bible is translated correctly. I do not change the Bible. The Bible changes me. And it changes other people too. Like that guy that called me. The Word of God changed his mind instantly. And I, I loved that. So they depart from the word and they, when they start saying, I believe that this verse doesn't really say this. So what happens when in the King James, God says, I want you to remove the sodomites. But in the NIV, God says, I want you to remove the temple prostitutes. Who changed that? And why? It's a matter of historical fact. We know that at least two people who helped translate the original NIV were sodomites. At least two of them have come out. Okay? So they removed sodomite from the Bible and changed it deliberately into something else. Okay? Isaiah 30, 10, which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. Rick Warren went to Orange County, California, and he went knocking doors, and he did a survey, and he asked the people of Orange County, if I started a church in this area, what would it take to get you to come to my church? And they said, we want new music. Okay, new music. We don't want to feel condemned by anything when we come. Okay, won't condemn them. We want to be able to dress however we want when we come to God's house. Okay, let them dress how they want. And he let lost people make the demands of him of what it would take to get them into his church. And when he built his church, that's exactly what he did. And he had to have campuses all over Orange County and Los Angeles, and now he's got satellites all over the world, and he's, he's Mr. Church Man. But basically, the people said to him, prophesy deceit to us. Prophesy, what did I do? Change my... Scriptures, yeah, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. They told him that they don't want to feel condemned by anything, and so that's what he does. Doesn't condemn anybody. How many times has Joel Osteen preached on hell? How many times Joel Osteen has, has he ever mentioned the word sin? He never uses it. Do you know why? He believes that if he says the word sin, then it's going to cause people to sin because he believes he has magic powers with his words. 
He believes if he says hell, then people are going to go to hell because he condemned them to hell by what he said. So he never says it. And so the world has told the churches, don't tell us what we're doing wrong. And we'll come to your church. And their churches are always full. Always. Jeremiah 14, 14. Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. They departed from the word of God. They're preaching out of their own deceitful heart. They're preaching because they want people to like them and put money in the offering plate. They preach their own lust to those people. That's how they're deceived. Strong drink will deceive you. How many of you know that? Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. You believe strong drink will deceive people. Amen. Jeremiah 51, 6. Flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render under a recompense. Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. The word mad does not mean angry, it means crazy. They're out of their mind because God used Babylon to deceive people who only want to be deceived. And there are millions of people who go to a church but will not listen to anybody condemning them for anything that they've done. And so therefore the churches don't do it anymore. No condemnation. Revelation 17 here is Mystery Babylon. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying, Come hither and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden, here it is, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations. And that's what God said. God said Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. God used Babylon to deceive people who only want to be deceived. Now, turn to Ezekiel chapter 14. And then turn to 1 Kings 22. Ezekiel 14, 1 Kings 22. It gives me time to get a little drink of water. How do we explain this verse? And if the prophet be deceived when he has spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of my people, Israel. So, does God lie? How can this be that God himself deceived that prophet I mean the things that Kenneth Copeland Joel Osteen Pope Francis Joseph Smith Charles Taze Russell who started the Jehovah's Witness cult the things that these people say are false how is it that they came to that false teaching how did God send deception to these men to Ellen White, who started the Seventh-day Adventist cult, who says, if you, don't go to, if you go to church on Sunday, you have the mark of the beast. You must go to church on Saturday. You must go to church on Saturday, and if you don't, you're not saved. That's their doctrine. They believe that you have to keep the fourth commandment or you cannot go to heaven. You're not really saved. But Paul said, it's by grace that we're saved through faith. So how did she get deceived? Turn to 1 Kings 22. I want you to see this in your Bible. I want you to underline this. This is very, very important. The setup of the story is God is going to kill Ahab. Ahab and his wickedness. Ahab and Jezebel, his wife. Or Bill and Hillary. Hillary. 
Sounds about right, doesn't it? Listen, they're not getting away with anything. They're not getting away with anything. They're going to stand before Almighty God and give an account. Okay? Now, God's going to kill Ahab in the battle the next day. And God is going to work everything out so that Ahab is slaughtered in the battle the next day. In the very place where Ahab and Jezebel had Naboth killed so, Je so they could steal his vineyard. That's the very place the dogs are going to lick the blood of Ahab. God promised that. So God set this whole thing up. Because he had, who was I think Jehoshaphat with him. Jehoshaphat was the king of Judah. And Jehoshaphat said, I want to know how you know that we're going to win this battle. Because if you get me involved and my army's involved, I don't want to get involved in a slaughter. So how can we know that God is in this thing? So Ahab called his prophets, about 400 of them. And he said, oh, prophets of God, tell me whether or not we're going to win this thing. And they all said, oh, yeah, we see it in the vision very clearly. God said, you're going to win this thing. and Oh, it's going to be a great battle. One guy took some iron and he made iron horns out of it. And he said, with these horns, you're going to prevail against the enemy. And Ahab said, see, it's in the bag. These guys are prophets of God. They, they said that to me. And Joshua said, you know, I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. Don't you have somebody that actually speaks for God? See, Jehoshaphat knew his shepherd's voice, didn't he? Do you know your shepherd's voice? Do you know Jesus when he talks to you? Do you recognize it? And it's true. Sheep get accustomed to one shepherd, don't they? One shepherd. And one shepherd can call them in and one shepherd can lead them, but another shepherd can't do it. They won't, they're confused by it. But the sheep know their shepherd's voice. And my question is, this is knowing. Do, would you know Jesus? Would you recognize his word when it was spoken? So finally Ahab said, you know, I got, there's a guy named Micaiah, but I don't like him. Why? He never says anything good to me. He always says bad things. Well, Ahab, that's the guy you need to listen to especially with your wife. You need to listen to him. So he calls Micaiah in. And he says, Micaiah, tell me what you see. And Micaiah told him. He said, hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. Now think about this. When Jesus separates the sheep from the goats, who's on the right hand? The sheep, who's on the left hand? Where do the goats go? Into the fire, everlasting punishment. So I believe it's very possible that God has his righteous angels on his right hand. And the Bible uses the term evil angels on his left hand. And God controls every one of them. He controls every one of them. So, the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this matter, and another said on that matter. So they all had their opinions about, these are angels. These are devils and angels, and they're all saying, here's how we can do it. And he said, there came forth a spirit, an evil angel, a devil, and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. So now you know. I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. Now do you understand how God does that? He sends a willing evil spirit to go and be a lying spirit in the mouth 
of that prophet. Now that man, that preacher, may say, Oh, I feel the Spirit coming on me. Oh, I'm getting a word from God. He may act like it's the Holy Spirit, but it's not. You know why? It doesn't match what's in this book. And if it doesn't match what's in this book, it's not of God. Can I hear you say amen? True deception is in the heart. Deuteronomy eleven sixteen. 16. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived. And you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Jeremiah 17, 9 again. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Matthew 13, 15. For this people's heart is wax gross and their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes have they closed lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. And should understand with their heart. And should be converted and I should heal them. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. It's all about your heart. Matthew 15, 8. This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Matthew 15, 18. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile the man. Remember, it's not what we put in our bodies that defiles. It's what comes out. Because what comes out of the body comes from the heart. And those are evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. There's seven things here, by the way. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands defiles not a man. I've eaten with unwashed hands hundreds of times. I'm still okay. But what's, you know what's in my heart? Do you want to know what's in the heart of Mike Hoggard? Uh, evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. That's why my heart has to be yielded over to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords so he can reign and tell me what to do. Now, Ezekiel 14, turn there. We're going we're gonna to get to the heart of it. It's almost 9 o'clock, and I'm going to try to get you out of here very quickly, but this, to me, is very, very important. Here's why. I'll say it like this. Here's why some people read even the Bible and get deceived. Ezekiel 14. God's going to make this very plain and clear to us. Then, certain, then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols where? In their heart. That means that they have another God before God. But it's in their heart. And you can't get it out of there. No man can take it out of there because it's in the heart of man. Only God can take it out. But you've got to want it out. And whatever that idol is, maybe it's, the, maybe it's a different God or maybe, it's a, maybe you already have a preconceived idea of how God is and every time you read the Bible, you jam whatever you read into your preconceived idea. That's an idol. Because it's a God that you have carved out in your mind that does not match the God of this Bible. Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. So, you have an idol and you have a sin. A repeated sin. One that you don't like doing, but you do it anyway. And it hasn't gone away. And some people don't want it to go away. Are there people who sit in church every Sunday who have a sin in their heart and after Sunday church they live out that sin throughout the week? but become holy 
during the Sunday church service. Are there people like that? Absolutely. They're everywhere. Everywhere. There are preachers like that. There are preachers like that. So they have a sin in their heart that they won't let go of. They want to keep it. And they think that they can be just as saved as everybody else and just as right as everybody else and keep their sin. And they want to. So God said, should I be inquired at all by them? Should I answer them when they ask me things? Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face. Here it is. And cometh to the prophet. The prophet, in this case, is the sure word of prophecy, the Bible. That's the prophet nowadays. We have a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you, well, you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star shi- arise in your hearts. So you have an idol in your heart or you have iniquity in your heart that you will not let go. You don't want to let go. You like doing it. And when you go and inquire of God, when you go to the Bible... God says, I the Lord will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. He'll read the Bible and be deceived in his mind because he won't read it right. He won't know it. God will hide its meaning from him and he will think all kinds of things. I'm just going to go ahead and say this one. The earth is not flat. But I have encountered people who swear that the Bible says it. And you know what? They've never quoted two verses because that's the standard, right? Out of the mouth of two witnesses. They've never quoted two verses that say that. Never. Why is it then that they go to the Bible, if they do, and think they see in here that the world is flat? Stumbling block of their iniquity and the idols in their heart. And God answers them according to the idols and the wickedness. That, may, that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart because they are all estranged from me through their idols. People, get rid of your idols. Put away your transgressions. Get your heart right with God. Confess, repent. Let God take you and chasten the fire out of you until you can't hardly live. And let God take you and remold you and make you in his image so you think right. Amen? Uh, Man, I've got... Let me just give you this very quick. I want to encourage you. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Not set you free, make you free. There's a difference. You open the door to that cage. And that parrot will not leave. But if you grab him and pull him out and take him and Say, go. You have now made him free. Some people have been in bondage so long that the door is open and they're not leaving because that bondage is all they know. That's a shame. Amen.
But you shall, if you continue in the word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The Lord who shall abide in thy tabernacle, who shall dwell in thy holy hill, he that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. You know what that means? You're quoting Bible verses to yourself. For his merciful kindness is great toward us. The truth of the Lord endureth forever. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and thy law is the truth. Get in the word. Turn off the internet. If you need to, turn off the internet. Because there's so much falsehoods everywhere, all over the internet. And some people just jump on everything that they find. And I would just rather they turn their internet off and just read their Bible. You know, people read the Bible for hundreds of years and never said, I think the Bible says the earth is flat. Never said it one time. Okay? They got it from the internet. And now, because of the stumbling block of their iniquity, they think it's there. But it's not. One guy wrote a comment, and I posted a video about the flat earth, and it was very nice. Very nice video. I was very reasonable with people showing them that this Satan is not covering up anything about the earth. And a guy wrote in a comment, and he, he was a flat earther apparently, and he said, the Bible says the moon is round like a tire. The Bible says the moon is round like a tire. There are two places in the Bible where God said they were wearing the tire of the moon. They were wearing the attire. Attire means attire. They were adorning themselves with decorations like the moon, and God was getting them for it. And this guy said, the Bible says the, the moon is round like a tire. I'm not kidding you. Okay? He needs to read more. It didn't mean a tire. It meant a tire. But that's what happens. If you would ask them, do they believe John 3.16? Do they believe Ephesians 2.8.9? Do they believe Romans 10.9 and 10? They spend all their time promoting and pushing a, false earth, a flat earth will not speak the gospel. They are saying that that in itself is the gospel. You have to believe the earth is flat or God won't accept you. And I'm gonna, I've got a website up and I'm telling everybody they're lying. I'm doing it nicely, but they're not telling the truth. Preach the gospel, give them the gospel, don't give them that stuff, amen? But it, it comes, it happens in your heart. Your heart can be drawn away Hey, let's get honest. Even in marriages, our heart can get drawn away. Churches is like a marriage. I'm the pastor of a church, and those people are like my wife. And sometimes those people get drawn away to other churches, to false doctrines. Boy, that hurts. Guard your heart, people. Guard your heart. Let Jesus keep on the throne as King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen? Amen. Father in heaven, we come before you. God, we thank you for this lesson. It needs to be preached. This, this word needs to be preached all over the world. God, I don't have the whole world to preach it to, but I have a few and they need to hear it because I need to hear it. Father, keep my heart the way it should be. Never, ever let me turn aside to the left or to the right. Father, bless my family. Bless my church. Bless these people that have come. Help them, dear God, that their heart stays right with you. 
that you really are the King of kings and Lord of lords living inside of them, ruling from the heart so that we don't go astray. Father, if there's anything in our hearts that's not right, remove it. Because God, you're the only one that can. Help us, dear God, to be your disciples and help us to hold fast to your word and continue in your word that we be not turned away on the day of judgment. Father, thank you, Lord, for meeting with us. Thank you for this good group. We pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen. God bless you.